there is something I forgot to do, which will be shocking to you all, since I never forget things. Um, I have a gift for Tara. Uh, her baptismal certificate in, is in here, and we've got her a Desire of Ages as well. And I forgot to call for the vote. <laughs> so I don't think, Jerry, if you want to come get it, there's a card and some stuff. So we want her to be blessed and have uh, the resources that are going to be a blessing in her journey. She's got a Bible uh, already. Uh, in the Seventh-day Adventist Church, we do formally vote people into the worldwide membership and into the membership of the local church. Normally that would have happened before, but I forgot. Is there a motion? Uh, I see some hands. I'll say that is a motion in a second. All who love Jesus and want to welcome her, say amen. 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 All right. Tara, we love you. I know you're getting changed, but uh, glad that we can welcome you into membership as well. Heavenly Father, may the words of my mouth, the meditations of my heart, be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. Wow, 2024. It, uh, you know, it happens every year. I don't know why it should be a, a surprise or a big deal, but it, it's interesting how time marches on. Uh, delighted to be able to worship with you on the first Sabbath of 2024. As we turn the page to a new year, um, it's always an interesting thought about where should we begin our spiritual journey. And as is so common uh, with our culture and society of resolutions and new commitments, it's tempting to go into a, a, an area of kind of a back to basics. And so I was praying about it and, and even uh, getting, as we were working on our, our calendar and uh, trying to decide what direction to go, is just asking God to to give direction and, and wisdom for how do we begin 2024. Pastor Paul Raj, again, a lovely sermon to end 2023 and establish some parameters uh, uh, for, for commitment moving forward and how we can take grasp of the faith and, and wealth of the Father. And um, uh, very encouraging. So many angles we could go when it comes to you know, disciplines, uh, you know, prayer and the basic Christian uh, disciplines, the fundamentals of faith and things like that. But as the Lord uh, uh, spoke and, and as I prayed about it, He took me in this direction. So through the month of January, the first four Sabbaths in January, uh, we're going to be examining uh, kind of a core fundamental reality of our faith. Um, and you'll see where I'm going here very quickly. But it goes to the identity of the Seventh-day Adventist believer, our identity. That's what we're going to be talking about. And it does involve angels. Now, I know that because of uh, Children's Church, not many young people are here, and it's absorbing our teens as well because they need a lot of help. So I, I changed from, from Kids Quiz to Teen Trivia, uh, but there's not even many uh, 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 young people at all. So we're going to have to make this a little more uh, gen general and generic. It's time to get back to school, though, young people. we got to get back to school. And so uh, we still, I still like to have interactive uh, time in the church. And Mark, would you, would you be Toby for me today? Um, so uh, we just have a few young people. So we're going to make this, we're all teens today. All right, we're all teens today. Uh, so if you want to help out, uh, this again is just mostly trivial and, and fun, but it gets us going in the direction of the topic. Uh, what do you think, true or false? Guardian angels it's a nice thought, but the Bible really doesn't teach that. What do you think, true or false? Let's have someone raise a hand. It's always it the around. furthest away. If you had walked over here, it would have been someone over there. It just is the way it goes. Adon, hey, I'm glad you're here, Adon. What do you think? Are there? True. Okay, now I did word this kind of backwards, didn't I? They're a nice thought, but not. So you don't think the Bible teaches in guardian angels? <laughs> okay, so this is, this is the teacher error here, probably, the way I worded it. The answer really is false. Now, the Bible doesn't come right out and say, there are guardian angels, you know, Proverbs 21, 2, or something like that. But there is, it's almost an assumed reality in Scripture. It doesn't come right out and say it, but it kind of assumes that believers know that God has placed angels as part of our, our, our experience. This is one of the passages, though, that makes it pretty clear. Uh, Jesus says, don't see that you do not despise one of these little ones, for I say to you that their angels, 
Notice that? Not an angel or the angels. He actually applies a personal connection. They're angels as though there are angels that belong to young people in heaven, continuing to see the face of my Father who's in heaven. And this is one, there, there are not a lot of these verses, but there's several of them where you have this personal connection between angels and humans. Even in the book of Daniel, it's very clear that the angel that ministered to Daniel was Daniel's angel. Even to the point when Daniel's praying and he's asking God, I need help there, the angel that comes to him and says, I'm sorry I'm late, Daniel. I had other things I was taking care of, but now I'm here. As though the angel was saying, I'm your angel. No other angel could answer uh, in the way that you wanted. I'm the angel assigned to you. So it seems, and again, I, I, I'm not going to arm wrestle you over it, but it seems as though the idea of a guardian angel is kind of an assumed reality um, in, in the scriptures. So if that's true, that we have guardian angels, then when Jesus came on earth, he had a guardian angel. So who was Jesus' guardian angel? Was it Gabriel, Michael, Kalel, or Raphael? And by the way, any of you who have had a classic Christian education, you would think of Raphael different uh, than others who think of a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle. <laughs> but you never know. Who, who is Jesus' guardian angel? Anyone? Oh, right over here. Yeah, what are you... Oh, well, she doesn't need a microphone, does she? Gabriel. Gabriel. Oh, so good. J is that Jameson? Har oh, Harper. I'm sorry. Wonderful. Uh, you know, almost for certainly, Gabriel was that uh, individual. He, he only appeared, very mysterious in a way. Gabriel, only, by name, only appears four times in the Bible, twice in the book of Daniel and twice in the book of Luke. Um, but yet several other places that talk about angels ministering to Jesus, it's rather, uh, again, an inference that the angel was none other than Gabriel. And we could talk about um, uh, other angels and, and things like that, but there's a, a kind of a, a rule in Scripture, not, not in all cases to be sure, but just like Jesus commanded us to go out two by two, it seems that the angels operate also in twos. Even the words cherubim and seraphim, that I am at the end, it can be plural, but it can also be dual. Hebrew has an extra, uh, not tense, not voice, uh, uh, not, you know, you have, in, in English we have singular and plural. Um, other languages have other breakdowns of, of numbers, and Hebrew has dual. So there are times when this literally means two. Cherubim means two. Seraphim means two. If you remember at the Garden of Eden, cherubim were placed. Two angels were placed at the gates of Eden with flaming swords going in every other way to prevent man um, from having access to the tree of life. Sodom, it was two angels that went in to, to rescue Lot and his family, specifically two. Um, at the throne of God, it's two angels that flank the throne of God, the, the, the cherubim that flanked there. At the empty tomb, John specifically says there were two angels that announced that Jesus had risen. And of course, at the ascension of Christ in Acts chapter 1, it was two angels who announced to those watching the same Jesus who you've seen shall return in the same way as he has left. So it's very interesting. So not only do we probably have a guardian angel, we probably have two. Do you like that? Some of you need three, but you got two. What does the word angel mean? You know, words have meanings. Uh, we have not, uh, we've, we've basically taken the Greek word angelos and we pronounce it in English to get the word angel, but it has a meaning. What does it mean? Wing, servant, minister, noble spirit, messenger. Um, raise your hand. Let's get some, some help here. We have a few young people that have helped out. Come on, class. Let's move this along. Oh, you're so worried about getting it wrong, and you think pastor's going to make fun of you. I'd never do that. That's so far beyond. Oh, Bailey wants to say, okay, can you say it? Here's a microphone. Say it in the microphone. Messenger. Messenger. We have a smart child here. I think this is a, a good family. <laughs> That's right. It, it, it means Messenger. Literally, when you read the, the word angel, 
It is a, a word that has a translated meaning that means messenger. And by the way, it's not always clear in uh, both Old Testament and New Testament when you come across the word. In the Old Testament, it's the word malak. In the New Testament, angelos. Um, whether it means angel like we would think of or whether it means messenger. One of the best examples of this is Malachi chapter 3, where the word for angel is used twice. But in most of your English translations, you will not see the word angel. You'll see the word messenger. And here's what it says. Behold, I'm going to send my messenger, and again in Hebrew, malak, and he will clear the way before me. And then it uses the same word again. And the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, he is coming, uh, says the Lord of hosts. Now, why would they not translate this as angels? Because it's pretty clear from, the, from a, uh, a Christian perspective that the first angel is John the Baptist, and the second angel is Jesus Christ. So translators in the English language, you could look it up in your own version, see what it says. Most of your English Bibles, they will not record this as angel. They'll translate it and call it messenger because they're interpreting it for you, by the way. They're saying, I'm going to interpret this word because it's not referring to a, a, a winged uh, a, a spiritual being. It's, returning to John the, it's referring to John the Baptist. It's referring to the, the messenger of the covenant. We're going to leave it as the word messenger. So this gives us an interesting insight even into our own Bible study. Not every time that you read the word angel does it mean, you know, you know Gabriel and, and uh, the feathery wing guys that fly around, Okay. It can also mean other things. So, angel means messenger. It usually refers to God's special order of creation. We sometimes call ministry and spirits who carry the special message and service of God. But it can and does in the Bible also sometimes refer to people. Joshua and Caleb are called angels in the Bible. David, John the Baptist. Now, sometimes they'll use words like like an angel or as an angel. But the word or the characteristic of angel is applied to them. Stephen, Paul, others in the Bible are given angelic uh, def, uh, you know, characteristics and defining. And then we also know that even the Lord himself identifies himself as the angel of the Lord. When Moses came to the burning bush and, and he says, take off your shoes because it's holy ground, the Bible says it was the angel of the Lord. All right? So we know that wasn't Gabriel and, and the, you know, the flying, uh, I don't want to have to do this the whole time. I feel like a chicken. Um, but um, there are times when angel even refers to God. And of course, Michael, the archangel, is no uh, created being. That is none other than Jesus Christ himself. Jesus is not an angel, but he does use that title to refer to himself in the scripture. So archangel, the greatest angel or greatest messenger who ever was God, it applies to Jesus Christ. Jesus himself says, the Lord will descend from heaven with a loud shout and with the voice of the archangel. That is a reference to Jesus. So Angel can refer to more than just the order of beings um, that we often think of them. Uh, number four, will we become angels in heaven? And people use this verse sometimes in Isaiah, they will mount up with wings like eagles. And eagles are sometimes symbolically used to refer to angels. So does this mean when we go to heaven, we're going to become angels? You guys are quiet today. Is this what 2024 is going to look like? I don't know. Come on, come on, unless anyone, uh, I won't make fun of you too bad if you get it wrong. I just want to hear some thoughts. Are we going to become angels when we go to heaven? Oh, Lisa wants to shout into the microphone for all to hear. Oh, I'm sorry, we have a young person. Angels. Yeah. Angels are wonderful, aren't they? I did hear a chorus of no's, <laughs> and I'm going to agree. Yes, we love angels. And while, while in our redeemed and our perfected nature, we will have certain attributes that we some, sometimes attribute to angels. Most people agree angels are of a different created order than humans. So while we may be able, and I believe we will be able to fly when we get to heaven. I, I do. I think we're going to be able to use our mind and, and, and manipulate the, the, the physics of this world in ways that we, we can't even imagine. I think we're going to be able to swim underwater without having scuba gear. I mean, why would God create all that diverse, beautiful things in the seas and the oceans if we can't access that and see it? I think we're going to have wonderful attributes, but we're still going to be different than the order of angels. I think just like the animals are of a different order, and bacteria are of a different order, they have their place, they have their purpose, but they are of a different species, uh, a different order of creation. So no, I, I don't think it's biblical to say that we're going to become angels. Is that okay? Well, I said it is, so it's okay. <laughs> Last question, and I may have asked this one before. Forgive me if I repeat sometime of my questions, but I want to see how observant we are as a church. We have three wall displays in our lobby. Don't look Nobody go to the bathroom right now. 
What are those three beautiful, wonderful wall displays that we have in our lobby that you walk by all the time and should love and adore and keep near to your heart? Okay, Bailey has one. Bailey, what, what do we have in our lobby? Three angels. Oh, three angels. Have you guys noticed we have three angels in our lobby? What, other, what are the other two, though? Oh, shock. Uh, Eva. Eva says she thinks she knows. She's kind of a smart one. <laughs> the teacher, I think. Second coming of Jesus. The second coming of Jesus. So that's this one here. And one more. All right. Yeah, we have. God and Jesus. Wow. God and Jesus is in our lobby. I agree. But what specific piece of art is remaining? I have nowhere else to be today. We can just <laughs> take our time. Oh, Miguel. Sorry, sometimes you got to jump and shout and get my attention. The Samaritan woman. Um, oh, they're just, uh, not kind of. Well, by the well. Jesus by the well. Okay, the woman at the well. The woman at the well. So right behind Robin. On the wall right there is the woman on the well. Sorry about the glare when I took this picture. Uh, the sun was kind of coming in. But this is the other picture, the woman at the well. And then as Bailey mentioned, we have the three chrome angels. And there's a whole story behind these angels. Where's Bob Thacker? Bob told me that story at one part, and I have forgotten it. Um, but I need to be reminded about the origin and the story behind the three angels. But we put the three angels in our lobby. And um, uh, in addition to our, our other pictures, and uh, we embrace the three angel uh, imagery to a large degree in our church. Back to basics. The revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, I know we've been preaching. I preached a little bit out of Revelation. I think young adults, are you still studying Revelation? Um, and uh, uh, Pastor Jean did a series uh, on the book of Revelation uh, for his week of prayer. But the Lord brought me back to just uh, this idea uh, and I want to share with you today. The revelation of Jesus Christ is how the book of Revelation begins, right? And it means both that the Jesus gave this vision, it's the, His vision that He is giving, the revelation of Jesus Christ, and it's also about Jesus Christ. It's a revelation of Jesus Christ. And I think if there's ever a time in our lives when we need a renewed understanding of a vision of Jesus Christ in the church today and in the world today, it's 2024, we need Jesus Christ in our lives. We need a revelation of Jesus Christ. We need to have a firm foundation and understanding of who the Lord Jesus Christ is in our lives. Seventh-day Adventists sometimes get accused of being obsessed with prophecy, of being obsessed with the book of Revelation, of being obsessed with eschatology. You want to know why that is? Because it's a revelation of Jesus Christ, and Seventh-day Adventists are obsessed with Jesus Christ. Now, to our public persona, when we do a lot of our evangelism or our television ministry, a lot of what we produce to the public when we're trying to do our outreach ministries or trying to get attention, we use the apocalypse, we use the beasts, we use 666, we use the Antichrist, we use, you know, uh, atomic bombs growing off. We're trying to get people's attention. And when you come to evangelistic seminars and things like that, often it's starting with Matthew 24 or Daniel 2 or something related to prophecy. And that has created an idea outside of the Adventist community that that's what we're obsessed with, that, that all we talk about is the mark of the beast, that all we talk about is 666, that all we talk about is the book of Revelation. Now, obviously, we, we, we know that's not true and times are changing, but some at times we've lost the reality, even in the church, that the core of all of the prophetic and apocalyptic things that we study is that it is a revelation of Jesus Christ. When I first became a Seventh-day Adventist, I grew up a Christian. I was Pentecostal. I knew the foundation, fu foundational beliefs of Christianity. I loved Him. I believed I was serving the Lord Jesus to the best of my knowledge before I joined the Seventh-day Adventist church. But after I became an Adventist, I was enamored with the new things I'd learned. I'd loved seeing the character of God in the law like I'd never seen it before. I loved knowing the health message. I loved knowing, uh, you know, the, the blessings of Ellen White. I loved uh, uh, seeing uh, uh, so many more facets of Christianity that I'd never seen that I was learning as I studied the truths and the doctrines of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. I loved learning about the mortality of the soul. Any of you who did not grow up believing in eternal hell, you might not appreciate the blessing of learning that the eternal hell is not biblical. 
And it was a relief. It, was, it restored the character of God to me. I was so excited to embrace the truths and doctrines of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and then I went to college. Walla Walla. And I'm not putting down Walla Walla, okay? I didn't. I, I was uh, uh, baptized in February, and by August I was in Walla Walla. <laughs> I too was baptized, Tara. If I was a little older than you, I was, uh, I was 20 when I was baptized into the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Uh, but anyway, so I go to Walla Walla, and by the way, if I've shared this story, I apologize, Mark. I have like three stories, and I repeat them. And, um, but, um, uh, and I go as kind of a, a fresh newbie in the faith, and, and I'm excited as a theology student to get in and meet with these teachers, Old Testament, New Testament. I was contemplating becoming a pastor, and I, I noticed something very quickly among many of my peers who had grown up in the church, and I said, yeah, I can't wait to study more about the sanctuary. I can't wait to study more about the law. I can't wait to study more about the mortality of the soul. And, and, and to me, these things were very fresh and vibrant, but to many of them, they were very dry. And they would say things to me like, well, that's all fine and well, but I really want to talk about Jesus in class. And I said, well, I do too, but that's interesting. But don't, can't we also talk about the health message and how that's so important and vital to it? Yeah, that's fine too, but I want to find out about Jesus. And this caused me kind of an internal dilemma because I didn't understand, you know, isn't Jesus part of this? What's going on with Jesus over here? So when I went back to my hometown where I'd grown up and where I had been uh, joined the Seventh-day Adventist Church, I met with one of the uh, instrumental elders of the church that I'd studied with. His name is Rick Sloop. Um, and I said, Rick, I'm confused. I want to go to Walla Walla and I want to be a good theology student. I want to learn more about the Seventh-day Adventist Church. But all of my peers are telling me that they don't want to learn the Seventh-day Adventist truths. They want to learn about Jesus. And what, what is that all about? And I'll never forget how Rick answered because it didn't catch him off guard. It didn't cause him to stumble. He didn't even hesitate. He kind of chuckled to himself and just right without missing a beat, he said, David, you have to understand our doctrines are centered on Jesus. If Jesus isn't the center of what we believe, then we don't believe it. So we believe in the Sabbath because Jesus is the Lord of the Sabbath. And we believe in the truth of the second coming, not the secret rapture, not the other spiritualized or, or, or kind of... We believe in the reality of the coming of Jesus because Jesus is at the center of that doctrine. And we believe the health message because Jesus is at the center of the creative of our bodies. And this is the temple of Jesus. And so he began to share with me how, how, how over time... There have been times when in the church we've separated Jesus out of our doctrines, and for a whole generation, young people were brought into the Seventh-day Adventist church understanding our doctrines but missing out on Jesus. So it wasn't that it was wrong what they were saying, it wasn't wrong what the experiences they were having, but there was, it was a, a pivotal moment early on in my journey in the church and journey to becoming a pastor that we keep Jesus at the center of everything we believe. The book of Revelation begins, the revelation of Jesus Christ, the revelation of Jesus Christ. So getting back to basics, getting back to the fundamentals, getting back to the foundations is making sure that our faith is filled with Jesus Christ. It goes on to say, who testified to the Word of God, the testimony of Jesus. Oh, I want to go back here for a second. He communicated it by who? By Gabriel. That's Gabriel. It was Gabriel who came to John on Patmos, in addition to the Lord Jesus Christ himself. But Gabriel was intimately involved with the workings of Jesus Christ, and Gabriel was there with John, who testified to the Word of God, the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Blessed Blessed is he who reads and hears the words of the prophecy and heeds the things that are written in it. It shouldn't be a curse to study Revelation. It should be a blessing. And then he says, for the time is near. Now, John wrote this a long time ago, and it's 2024. And if the Lord tarries, there's going to be a 2025. Maybe. Is 2024 the last year? Things happen rapidly, friends. We are to live our lives with this reality before us, that the Lord is coming. He may tarry a hundred years, but we are to live and orient our lives with the nearness of the Lord always at the forefront of our mind. So I want to get into a particular part of Revelation, and we're going to move a little quickly here. I'm not going to get into all the breakdown and semantics, but just get to the idea that it's clear that the heart of Revelation is found in verses 12 to 14. It's not to say that the first 11 chapters are irrelevant or everything that follows it is secondary, but it's kind of like this. 
all of the Old Testament is there to prepare us for Jesus. If we study all of the Old Testament but, don't, but neglect to understand what Jesus does in the New Testament, we're really missing the point of the Old Testament. You see what I'm saying? And everything after Jesus, Acts and the epistles and everything, is the application of the faith of Jesus after His great sacrifice and work of being our Messiah. If we study everything after Jesus but we miss what Jesus did in the middle, we're kind of missing the point. You see what I'm saying? In the same way, Revelation is kind of like that. Everything building up to chapter 12 is preliminary and to give us a foundation so that when we get here, we know where we're at. And then everything after chapter 14 is the therefore or is the further exclamation of everything that God has said in these three chapters. So that's where we're going to go to right now in Revelation uh, is the the 14th chapter. And we're going to look at just one verse here to get, to get our bearings, to get our bearings for where we're going with angels among us. It's a beautiful verse. Just one verse, Revelation 14, 14, then I looked and behold a white cloud and sitting on the cloud was one like son of man having a golden crown on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. There are many second coming references in the book of Revelation, but this is one of the clearest and most profound. This is a clear, symbolic, metaphorical description of the second coming of Jesus Christ. This is the Lord on a white cloud, just like in the book of Acts when Jesus went in a cloud, right? And the the two angels came and said, the same Lord is coming in the way you saw Him go. He has a golden crown, Stephanos, crown of victory, All right, not a kingly crown. This is a golden crown of victory, not the crown of thorns. All right, and it's and it's an intentional contrast here between the crown of thorns and the crown of uh, uh, the golden crown of the Lord Jesus Christ. So he's on a white cloud. He's the Son of Man with a crown of victory, and he has a sickle in his hand. That's the harvest. He's come to harvest the world. This is a description of the second coming in the book of Revelation. But John says this in context of something that happened before it. Then I looked. Something happened just before this. And the thing that happened just before this is where we're going to look. It's called the three angels' messages. If you've been in the church any length of time, you've heard this before, you've been uh, exposed to it, but I want us to look at it again. And I want to make three points today. Um. I'm going to make my first point over here. I think I'm going to make it right here. You can be a faithful, loving, saved individual without having a deep understanding of the three angels' message. Okay? You can. You can love Jesus and have your place assured in heaven, and you don't really know much about the three angels' message. That is true. Point number one. Okay, I think I'm going to make point number two right here, spot on the carpet, right here, okay? You can be a Sabbath-keeping, law-abiding lover of Jesus Christ and not really know much about the three angels' message, not really know its core meaning and identity and message, and your place in heaven can be assured and you can have a wonderful walk with Jesus, okay? Point number two. One more point. I think I'm going to make it here, right here. You cannot be a Seventh-day Adventist Christian and not have a deep connection, knowledge, and appreciation of the three angels' message. You cannot be a Seventh-day Adventist without having a deep, significant attachment, understanding, and application of the three angels' message to your life. Did you get the three points? What was point one, number one over here? I don't want anyone to miss this. What was this point? You can be a Christian and love Jesus and not understand. I'm not trying to say that this is salvific. Jesus loves you and you love Jesus and you're going to heaven even if you've not really wrapped your mind around the three angels' message. And the second point I made right where this spot, right here, is you can even be a Sabbath-keeping, law-appreciating Christian 
and not have a deep understanding and appreciate and appreciate an application of the three angels' message. But friends, you cannot be a seventh day. Adventist. You are not a seventh day Adventist Christian because these messages are what a seventh day Adventist Christian is. They have defined our movement. They have motivated our church. They are part of the manifestation of what it means to call yourself a Seventh-day Adventist Christian. Now, you may not care whether you have that identification or not, but I want to invite you to consider the significance of what it means to understand the three last messages before the Lord Jesus Christ returns. These three messages are it, and they encapsulate the entire great controversy that is critical for planet earth to know so that more people can appreciate Jesus Christ and be part of his kingdom and part of the harvest when Jesus comes. That is our purpose of existence as Seventh-day Adventists. That is our identity. If we're doing anything else, we are not fulfilling our purpose. If we're doing anything else, we, are, we can still be saved, but we're missing our mission, and we're missing our identity. That is why we put them on our wall. That is why Three Angels Broadcasting Network called themselves that. That's why in many Adventist churches, you'll see the three angels. So we're going to examine what that means. We're going to define and get into what these messages are. But my, my, my message for you today is very simple and... Um, I think I'm ready to start preaching now. <clears throat> Just in brief, the first angel's message, and again, there's context to this. You can read the previous verses and chapters and, and all those things uh, uh, to get us in here, but we're trying to just delve into this uh, quickly as we, we uh, examine the three angels' messages. And I saw, John says, another angel. There's about 70 references to angels in the book of Revelation alone. They're all over the place. But these three are unique in how they are presented to John and how John records them. And I saw another angel flying in mid-heaven, having the eternal gospel to preach to those who live on the earth and every nation, tribe, and tongue, and people. Whose job is it to preach the gospel? According to this, it's an angel. I saw an angel, and that angel had the gospel, and that angel was going to preach it to the whole world. But then you have to ask ourselves a question. Who's that angel? Remember how I said earlier, not every time you read angel, does it refer to the winged ministering servant? You remember the flapping hobby? Yeah? Okay. Who is this referring to? Is this telling us that in the last days, God is saying to his church, hey, sit back, retire, relax. You guys have done an okay job up to this point, but from this point on, I'm having my angels take care of preaching the gospel. You don't need to worry about it from now on. Is that what this passage is telling us? Is this telling us that this is now the job of just preachers and evangelists and pastors? Is that what this is? This angel flying in the midheaven? Look at what Jesus says to us throughout the New Testament. He said to them, who's the them? The disciples, the believers in Jesus Christ, the church, go into all the world and do what? Preach the gospel. Jesus gives this mission at the very you know, outset, as he's ascending to heaven, he says, now as I'm leaving, I'm giving you a work to do, preach the gospel, not just in Israel, not just in the Middle East, not just in Turkey and, 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 and uh, the Roman Empire. You need to take it to all creation. And by the way, we could talk later about why he uses the word creation. Oh, a slide Jump down, but that's okay. And then in Matthew, a parallel verse to uh, the first angel's message is found in Matthew 24. This gospel of the kingdom shall preach where in the whole world, it says, as a testimony to all the nations, and then the end will come. We're familiar. This is a parallel uh, 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 passage or, or meaning to what the three angels' messages are, because here Jesus says this message is going to go out, and then the end will come. And then at the end of Matthew 28, we have the gospel commission. Go and make disciples of the whole world, baptizing them, as we've done today. This mission He's given to us. Luke says, don't leave me out on this. I want to talk about this too. In the book of Acts, 
He says, the Holy Spirit's going to come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses. What is a witness? A witness is someone who preaches the gospel, who shows that the power of God is coming into your life, and that the sin and selfishness has been put, uh, put to death, and that the virtues of God are developing in your life. That's what a witness is, both in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and even to the remotest part of the earth. Without a doubt, clearly, the work of preaching the gospel does not reside in the hands of angels. It resides in our hands. And just to make it even more clear, look what Peter says. Those who preach the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, in, in the, the inferences, they did so, things into which angels long to look. Angels not only are not who, angels like ministering spirits are not only what uh, uh, Revelation 14 is not meaning, it cannot mean angels. Angels cannot preach the gospel. You want to know why? Because they have not experienced the gospel. Now, they're affected by it. Don't get me wrong. The, great, the, the fall of Satan and the great controversy affects the angels, but those who are uh, spiritual beings unfallen who continue to serve the Lord Jesus Christ, they are not redeemed in the same way fallen individuals like you and me are. They can kind of tell you the facts, but they can't give you the experience. How many of you know the hymn? We sing a lot of hymns. How many of you know the hymn, Holy, Holy is what the angels sing? And I look forward to going to heaven to make the heavens ring. Uh, I can't remember all the lyrics. But when they sing salvation's story, they shall fold their wings. For, for angels never knew the something that your salvation brings. Who knows those hymns? <laughs> okay, did I get it close enough? Angels are not equipped to preach the gospel. This is a reference to you and me. It is the three angels are us. The three angels' message is our message. You and I. There are angels among us. And they're sitting in these pews right now. This is so crucial. I want you to notice something. John says, I saw another angel flying in mid-heaven. Where do these angels live? Now, again, this is, this is somewhat conjecture, and, and you can read commentaries and why. There's this this mid-heaven is used a few times in Scripture, but not enough to really establish a firm idea. But it's clear. John says these angels weren't quite in heaven, but they weren't quite on earth either. They live in a realm in between. They exist, they do their ministry caught between two realities. They're not quite in heaven, but they're not quite on earth either. They're flying in between. They're in the mid-heaven, okay? And what they're doing is they're bringing a heavenly, eternal reality, and they're bridging the gap with those who live on earth. Okay, do you see this? We live not quite in heaven, but we don't quite live on earth either as Seventh-day Adventists, as preachers of the gospel, as those who are living their lives as presentations of what the power of God does in our life. We don't live. We're not quite in heaven yet, friends. We're not there. I want to be there soon, but we're not there. We're to keep heaven in mind. We're to keep our eyes on heaven, but we're not to be so close or so focused on heaven that we forget about the things on earth. But neither do we live completely focused on earth. We do not live with our feet firmly planted. We are as a ship on the water, all right? The water's on the outside, but the heaven is above us, the earth is below. And our job, oh, the slides really get interesting here, don't they? But our job is to bridge the gap between heaven and earth. We live in between. We cannot be effective in presenting the eternal gospel if we have firmly planted our existence on earth alone. Nor can we be as successful if all we're doing is focusing on heaven. Let the earth go to hell. I don't care. I'm just going to heaven. If we have that mentality, we will not be fulfilling the three angels' message either. We live in between, caught between heaven and earth. And it's in that position that we have the greatest strength and possibility to be successful. We are to reach into and present the eternal gospel to those on the earth and draw that together and invite others to join us in that mid-heaven experience. <coughs> so let's learn from Stephen. 
Let's learn from Stephen this reality. You remember Stephen in the New Testament, in the book of Acts? Powerful preacher. It says that Stephen was full of grace and power. He was performing great wonders and signs among the people. God was working powerfully through Stephen. Stephen was a saved individual. Stephen was letting the Spirit of God work through him. But it caught the attention of those who disagreed. It caught the attention of the synagogue of the Jews who disagreed. And of course, they did what they, they always do. They persecuted him. And they bring him and they bring false witnesses. But it says they were unable to cope with the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. He's filled with the Spirit of God. He is filled with the gospel. He's filled with grace. And they cannot overcome him. And then it says, and fixing their gaze on him, all who were sitting in the council saw his face like the face of an angel. Like the face of an angel. And then he delivered the gospel sermon, one of the most powerful sermons that you read in the Bible, comes from Stephen in, in the seventh chapter of the book of Acts, where he outlines the plan of God going back from the beginning all the way to the death of Jesus Christ. He opens his mouth, and the eternal gospel comes from him. And as a result, uh, he pays for it with his life, we know, but as a result, he deeply impresses a young man named Saul, who later on becomes one of the greatest apostles ever because of the faith of Stephen. But I've always wondered, what does the face of an angel look like? Would you stand with me for a moment? We're closing, by the way, so be thankful. Stand with me. Most of you have one of these. Please take it out. Pastor, you're letting me use my phone in church? Yes. Take it out, put your camera on, and put it on selfie mode. I'm serious. Come on. Don't look at the person behind you. Hey, how you doing? No, no. Put it on you. Look at it. Selfie mode. That is the face of an angel. I'm serious. Look at it. Look at it. What, what makes it special? It's just your face. But that is the face of a person that God wants to use to revolutionize lives of those that the Holy Spirit has already gone on before, and He wants to use you before He returns to learn about the gospel. That is an angel's face. That's your face. And you are the angels of Revelation 14. You are. Those messages, if you love Jesus and you are willing to investigate further and go deeper, these are our messages. And they're powerful. And they're freeing. And they're wonderful. We're going to look at the first angel's message. We're going to look at the second angel's message. And we're going to look at the third angel's message as well. Because there are messages. While we're standing, let's sing, but we know not the hour. Masters appearing, yet signs are foretell that the moment is nearing when he shall return. Tis a promise most cheering, but we know not the hour he will come. Let us watch and be ready, he will come. Hallelujah, hallelujah, he will come in the clouds of 
his father's bright glory but we know not the hour there's light for the wise who are seeking salvation there's truth in the book of the lord's revelation each prophecy points to the great consummation but we know not the hour he will come let us watch and be ready he will come hallelujah hallelujah he will come in the clouds of his father's bright glory but we know not the hour we'll watch and we'll pray with our lamps trimmed and burning we'll work and we'll wait till the master's returning we'll sing and rejoice every omen discerning but we know not the hour he will come let us watch and be ready he will come hallelujah hallelujah he will come in the clouds of his father's bright glory but we know not the hour. he will come he will come he came already once he's coming again and there are angels among us who can help others be ready father help us lord in 2024 to make a renewed commitment to you a renewed powerful passion to be part of a world and a lifestyle that is in between heaven and earth. Help us to not be so firmly invested and planted on this earth that we miss our mission, and we miss our appreciation of what you're doing in heaven. And Lord, help us not to be so focused only upward that we forget we have a mission also on earth. Make us your angels, Lord. We are called, we are empowered, we are spirit-filled to be successful in sharing your love, your salvation, and your truth before you come. Help us, Father, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Happy Sabbath, jam and bread at 1.30. See you next week when you come to worship.